from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. Coming up on Ag Day, no deal as U.S. trade officials arrive home from China. People think it's just farmers that get hurt. It's the entire community, the entire state. The Chinese pushing back on buying for U.S. ag products. In analysis, why the wheat market may have legs. The real key in wheat today, I think, is the Black Sea. An early exclusive shows how the landscape of U.S. dairy is changing, plus innovation to include everyone during National Dairy Month. Ag Day. Brought to you by the Chevy Silverado, the most dependable, longest-lasting full-size pickups on the road. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Some of the administration's top trade officials are back on U.S. soil after traveling to China to discuss the future of trade. But Chinese officials showing strong resistance to taking more U.S. agricultural goods until broader trade pain points are put to rest. U.S. officials, including Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross and Chief Ag Negotiator Greg Dow, were in China to work out the details of China's promise to purchase more American farm and energy products. However, those details remain on hold as China says it won't buy more goods as long as the looming $50 billion worth of tariffs are still on the table. And the president tweeting Monday that farmers haven't been doing well for 15 years in Mexico, Canada and China and others have treated farmers unfairly. He said, quote, by the time I finish trade talks, that will change. Big trade barriers against U.S. farmers and other businesses will finally be broken. Massive trade deficits no longer, end quote. The soybean growers, pork producers, and cheesemakers worry businesses will suffer from retaliation if the U.S. moves forward with those tariffs. It's our second largest uh, export market, and it will uh, re reduce sales. There's no question. If there's tariffs imposed, people think it's just farmers that get hurt. It's the entire community, the entire state, the entire upper Midwest where agriculture is so important because we're not living uh, alone out on the farm and not seeing anyone. We are connected economically to our, en our entire population up here. And so um, are we going to get hurt? I hope not. No matter the outcome, economists say there are certain products like fruits and nuts that will continue to enter China. It just may not be a direct path to get there. You'd be surprised a number of these commodities have gray channels that will get into certain markets. Even if, even if something were to happen to NAFTA, even if something were to happen in, in our talks with China, and, and for whatever reason, uh, that whole relationship you know, completely fell apart and deteriorated. There's a number of growers out on the West Coast, if you were an example in the almond industry, would say, you know, those commodities will eventually get to where they need to get to in China. Walnuts is a perfect example. Almonds is a good example. Citrus is a perfect example. China's exports go down. Hong Kong's exports go up. Okay? And that's the result of these gray channels where these commodities actually get in where they are intended to go to, but they don't always get there on a direct channel, unlike other commodities like corn and beans. In places like Russia, trade restrictions and sanctions continue to impact food production. Four years ago, Western food from the U.S. and European Union was banned following sanctions against Russia for its annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. And while it caused issues early on, locally produced meat, cheese and fish is now flourishing. Since the sanctions, um, uh, there's been a lot more um, focus on local food. Um, since uh, we couldn't import um, uh, meat or uh, cheese anymore um, and uh, meat from certain countries uh, became uh, prohib prohibitively expensive uh, and only affordable to really rich people. Uh, a lot of uh, farms that uh, already were in place in Russia started uh, developing uh, much faster and started producing much better quality product. The government also pledging to encourage domestic production, offering loans and subsidies for the agricultural sector. Now, Russia is one of the world's largest grain exporters. It's also become a major supplier of meat to world markets. Agriculture is just days away from a major change in its agribusiness sector. That is Bayer. Plans to close its purchase of Monsanto Company this week, doing away with the Monsanto name. It's a $63 billion deal that's been in the works for several years now, but Bayer says it plans to officially buy Monsanto and close the transaction on Thursday. While the new company will be known as Bayer Ag, the merger isn't complete until the big divestitures happen. Most of those properties are being sold to BASF, 
And leaders from both Bayer and Monsanto say while the financial transaction is taking place this week, the two companies will continue to operate independently for an interim period. Bayer saying last week that all of the spinoffs and divestitures are expected to take about two months. Once the assets are sold, then Bayer Monsanto will begin to integrate. USDA releasing an updated crop progress report for the week. Corn planting is all but wrapped up. At 97%, it's ahead of the five-year average now. Michigan and Pennsylvania are still behind, but making progress. Nationally, the corn is rated 78% good to excellent. That's a tick lower than last week. In Iowa and Illinois, those crops are both at 81% good to excellent. We really had some, some prime growing conditions uh, for the corn and beans. Uh, we've, we've caught some pretty timely rains, um, and that's just today. We were able to catch another half inch of rain, so things are looking absolutely great. And uh, if things continue, uh, straighten up to be a, a, a great year. Soybeans, they're now 87% planted, 12 points ahead of the five-year average. Cotton is back on pace with three quarters of that crop now planted. However, what's in the field is struggling. Only 42% of the crop is rated good to excellent. And winter wheat harvest, it's rolling along. 5% has been cut. Texas is about a third done. Cindy Clausen in for Mike Hoffman again today. She joins us now with today's crop comments. Good morning, Cindy. Good morning, Clinton. We're starting off in Flag, Texas this morning, an area suffering from a major drought. Justin Dameron says the corn needs some rain, but this corn is growing nicely despite the lack of moisture. That's not the case everywhere. He says dry land crops are non-existent and a lot of irrigated crops fell behind during last week's 105 degree temperatures. The area did receive 0.2 inches of rain Sunday night. And Matt Nelson over in Burt County, Nebraska, sent us this picture of him side dressing some corn before the rain arrives. Matt says the corn is growing well in the heat, but the area is in need of even more rain. The U.S. drought monitor shows nearly 82% of Nebraska is drought free. The area is experiencing dryness in the southeast. Well, as we take a look at how winds are going to be shaping up today, here's a look at your wind speed forecast. A lot of it starting off uh, on the breezy side, especially over towards the eastern half of the Great Lakes. But as we put this into motion, we're going to see with those winds picking up in the southwest. That is not good news for uh, how dry it is out there for wildfires and the like. So as we head into tonight, we'll see some windier conditions in the upper Midwest and through the day on Wednesday, we'll see those winds picking up in the nation's midsection and once again in the Four Corners region. We'll have a lot more in your forecast coming up later on in the show, but now here are some hometown temps. Save time each day and receive the latest market prices directly to your cell phone with market updates. It makes it effortless to stay aware of shifting market prices. Just text MARKETS8 to 31313 to get started. The wheat market seeing a double digit dip in the red Monday. We'll discuss how the world's number one wheat exporter plays a role that's coming up in analysis. And June is National Dairy Month. We show you what the industry is doing to make sure everyone is included, even those who have a hard time digesting milk. Plan for the unexpected with weather forecast updates. Local forecasts are delivered right to your cell phone each morning, making planning a little bit easier. Just text WEATHER6 to 31313 to get started. John Deere is suing Precision Planning and Agco over claims of patent infringement. Filed in the U.S. District Court in Delaware, Deere's alleging that Precision infringed on 12 of its patents, including V-set seed meters and speed tube products. That technology allows seed to be placed accurately and uniformly with even crop emergence. Now in the lawsuit, Deere claiming the company has suffered damages as a result of the infringement, and it will continue to suffer damages as long as it continues. Now, the amount that John Deere is seeking from the lawsuits unspecified in those court documents. Agco bought Precision in September of last year. Here at the Agribusiness Desk, we have Mark Fite with the International Agribusiness Group. Mark, as we talk about the wheat market, and I know harvest is in full swing in the southern U.S., uh, but there's some things happening globally that are worth our attention. Yeah, I think domestically, you're not going to change the 
southern the, the hard red crop at all right. at this point and that market's all about what happens in, in the spring wheat in the dakotas and, and canada and actually that weather's starting to look a little better so okay. the, the real key in wheat today i think is the black sea mm -hmm. and you've got russia that a year ago with 85 million tons of production just was a huge hammer on the wheat market world wheat market all year now we're thinking that that crop's in the low 70s and probably shrinking that area was also one where USDA pinpointed an 11 million ton increase in corn, a record corn crop out of the FSU in uh -huh. their world balance sheet for 1819 that got us to 160, a very tight carryout, which I think is a, is a stretch. We're, our numbers that we run at IAG are at 150 million tons world carryout, and it, that's at a point where you start ha having to feed more wheat in Europe, and, and the Black Sea is shut out. Uh, Europe out of the trade, particularly France out of much of the world trade, they're going to be a bigger part of that. We saw the Matif market blow up early this week that, that pulled the U.S. market. So I think we have to focus on that, not just domestically. Yeah, do you think uh, there's enough uh, happening, enough momentum there to, to drag prices with it? Well, I think there is, and I think it's, it's critical at, at this stage. The next three weeks are critical for that for the Russian wheat crop. Okay. Um, there's a little bit of rain, there's enough to kind of keep that crop alive, uh, to make it thrive, not quite. So it's right on the edge. And I, th I think we've already seen the market respond and we're at relatively high levels because of some of the problems we've had in the US and, and in Europe. Now, can we take it to the next level? It's just, that's up to mother nature. You know, one, one run of the maps are, are going to change a lot of people's fortunes here. Okay, well, we'll keep an eye on it. Appreciate it, Mark. Thanks for bringing it to our attention. We'll be back with more Ag Day in just a minute. To talk to Mark, give him a call at 248-715-9222 or send him an email at mfight at iagroup.com. Welcome back to Ag Day here with Cindy Clausen looking at the weather map and Cindy, there are multiple fronts on the map today. Yeah, and you know there have been the past couple of weeks. The maps have been pretty muddled with various uh, fronts. We're going to see more active weather, especially in the eastern part of the country as we head through the uh, rest of this week. Let's take a look. As we start off looking up towards the Great Lakes area, we do have a front that's going to be cooling things down once again as we head through the day, starting off with a little rain there. We've got a stationary front across Florida into parts of the central and western Gulf Coast states, so look for some showers and thunderstorms there. High pressure kind of keeping things dry in the middle and into the Four Corners region. Maybe a little bit of moisture in the northwest as a weakening front approaches the Pacific Northwest. Moving into this evening, low pressure moves on off to the east. Another high moving into the Great Lakes area. We're going to start to pick up some moisture though as we get into Tuesday night and Wednesday into the upper Midwest. We're going to continue with the chances for some showers and thunderstorms kind of along that stationary front in the southeast. High pressure settles in. Nicer day for the eastern Corn Belt on Wednesday. We're seeing fairly dry uh, conditions in much of the Plains states and especially the western parts of the Plains really need some of that rain. We may start seeing some of that picking up as we get into the latter part of Wednesday. Here's a look at your precipitation estimate. The past 24 hours it's been fairly dry across most of the country. The tail end of that stationary front's been producing some showers and thunderstorms in parts of eastern Texas and into Louisiana as well. The northeastern quadrant of the country has been getting some showers and some thunderstorms a tiny bit off in the northwest. As we uh, finish off the next 24 hours, it's really going to be that stationary front. We have a lot more moisture available down in the Gulf Coast states and we'll see some showers and thunderstorms in the northeast, but fairly very spotty stuff along the rest of the northern part of the country. Still very hot in the southern plains. We're looking at 90s, even into triple digits, but look how much cooler it is in the Pacific Northwest and into the Northeast. You can really see where that ridge is built into the nation's midsection, where we're seeing 90s all the way up into parts of North Dakota. Then as we head into the overnight hours, we're going to see those temperatures dipping down into the 40s in some locations in the Northeast. Still really mild overnight low temperatures right under that ridge in the central part of the country. Country. Heading into tomorrow, we cool down a little bit on the northern stretches of the plains, but still pretty hot as we see a lot in 90s, maybe even some triple digits, especially in southwestern Texas. Taking a look at that jet stream, you can see that ridge right up here in the nation's midsection. A couple of troughs in the northeast and into the northwest. The ridge will kind of build a little bit and flatten out on the top, but notice how everybody gets warmer by the end of the week, especially as we get into Monday. Look at the, how high that ridge gets up into Canada. That is going to be some 
pretty big heat as we get into next week. That's a look at your national forecast. Now let's check on the weather where you live. Mountain Air, New Mexico, sunny and warm for you today with a high of 89 degrees. Heading over to Cotton Valley, Louisiana, showers and thunderstorms with a high of 86. And due west South Carolina, plenty of sunshine with a high of 82. Still to come is Canada signaling it's loosening the leash on its domestic production. Plus, why one economist says the landscape for U.S. dairy is changing. And later, a milk quenching consumers thirst for more digestible dairy. That as we head in the country. In our dairy report, NAFTA negotiators haven't given up on reaching a deal, but fresh tariffs and pressure from Washington is making for challenging negotiations. As we mentioned last week, President Trump announcing plans to move forward with tariffs on aluminum and steel for both Canada and Mexico. The news throwing a wrench in current NAFTA renegotiations. Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau saying over the weekend that Canada would consider more dairy access, but says discussions have been stalled because of the U.S. insistence on a five-year sunset clause and other topics. President Trump, meanwhile, continuing to raise the prospect of separate trade deals with Canada and Mexico, arguing that they are two very different countries. Now, as tariff talks remain, Farmer Max says global demand for dairy is at healthy levels. That includes with major markets like China and Mexico. In an early exclusive from Farmer Max, the feed demand for U.S. dairy rebounding in foreign markets. That's as world prices have caught up or even exceeded U.S. prices in early 2018. The volume of U.S. dairy exports set a new monthly record in March, with China's buys up 18 percent, exports to Mexico surging 20 percent. While Farmer Mac anticipates the competitiveness of U.S. dairy products to support milk prices in the months ahead, Kirk Covington of Farmer Mac says the U.S. dairy industry is divided. This dairy sector and this dairy industry has become very bifurcated. You have the very high efficient consolidated operators who do a marvelous job of controlling their expenses, marketing. Uh, they have all of their costs, you know, uh, in, in a manageable format that they can keep, right, that, 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 that they just have excellent bookkeeping. You've got the ones on the other end that are smaller dairies that have very little debt, may have a boutique operation where they're bottling their own milk, or they may have a special contract uh, with, with local producers. And so they continue to survive because they've, they've got a niche market. Unf Covington says milk prices should remain strong through the end of the year, but the two wild cards are trade disruptions and a strong U.S. dollar. If trade tensions calm down, new research shows the Chinese market is a potential boom for U.S. dairy interest. Market intelligent agency Mintel saying that yogurt and cheese sales are on the rise in China. Since 2014, annual retail sales growth for yogurt has risen at least 20 percent per year. Cheese sales jumped 15 to 25 percent from 2015 to 2017. Mintel is forecasting the dairy market to grow by more than 6.5 percent in value every year for the next few years, growing up to nearly $80 billion by the year 2022. When we come back, we'll continue in the dairy aisle and a type of milk gaining popularity. Ag Day, brought to you by Top Third Ag Marketing, farmer first with a plan for every market. In the Country, brought to you by Kubota's M5 Series, bringing new levels of comfort to hard work. Learn more at Kubota.com or visit your local Kubota dealer today. June marks National Dairy Month, and while those in the industry are toasting to the health and benefits of cow's milk, some in the industry are celebrating innovation, including help for individuals who have a hard time digesting dairy. It looks and tastes just like traditional milk, but this milk lacks a specific protein. It's called A2 milk, and it's showing up in supermarkets across the globe. Most cows produce milk that contains both A1 and A2 proteins, but some cows naturally produce milk without the A1 protein. And it's that protein that some claim causes bloating and other symptoms for certain people. But scientists are not yet convinced at Syracuse University. Biology professor Margaret Voss says there is not enough evidence yet to draw conclusions. There may be individuals that produce enzymes that cannot properly digest A1 milk, so it is plausible. But in terms of the science right now, the level of the science is uh, its just not where it needs to be. We just don't have those clinical trials. However, momentum is gaining as the so-called A2 milk is showing up in supermarket coolers, and now producers hope consumers will pay an extra dollar 
or more for a half gallon of A2. It contains uh, only A2 protein in the milk, which makes it easier to digest. The Ripley Family Farm in upstate New York retails its milk locally, but international companies are also involved. Nestle recently launched an A2 infant formula in China, and the Australia-based A2 milk company is pushing to expand its U.S. presence into the lucrative Northeast market. And there you have it. That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. It's been part of your day with us for Sydney Clawson and all of us here at Ag Dam, Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.